Yeah. You want to start us out, Howard? Okay. All right. Okay, let me start with this one. <clears throat> uh, this is a lady with the history of breast cancer, and I just want to show you one curious thing um, that's not related to the chest initially, but when they did the abdominal CT, as you can see in March 1, for a reason that I cannot fathom, they had a scout image that included the whole chest that you can see here. Usually, of course, the scout image looks like that. But this lesion here, which is not present on the axial images, was not seen. And it's a reminder to me to more carefully look at the scout images on a CT. I don't always do that. I forget. But it's a reminder. So here is a lesion. The next month, you can see it here. The patient has a catheterine for treatment of the breast cancer. You can see it's quite large, left suprahyla, left upper lobe. And you can see there is cavitation within. And here is the CT that goes along with that. And you can see the extent of the cavitation within this opacity in the left upper lobe. Let me bring up some thin cuts because the person reading this really just gave a differential that referred to metastatic disease. And you know, when you see a solitary lesion that big with cavitation, that doesn't really make sense for metastatic breast cancer. Um, the other clue that this may not be metastatic disease, other than that it's a cavitary lesion, is that there are some airways adjacent to it or in the lung adjacent to it that contain small amounts of interluminal material. So for example, here, if I make that a bit bigger, there may be some bronchioles up here that contain interluminal material. And certainly anytime we see a cavitary lesion and interluminal material in adjacent bronchi, one should think of an infectious process, a necrotizing pneumonia as an explanation for that. Maybe there's some here as well and here as well. So the combination of that is certainly not suggestive of metastatic disease from breast cancer as an isolated lesion. There are some cystic spaces there that I think are entirely incidental. I don't know what that represents. But this person turns out on culture and PCR to have tuberculosis. So this is tuberculosis um, as an unanticipated finding in a person with breast cancer. So it's kind of a gotcha, but it's tuberculosis cavitary necrotizing tuberculosis. What risk factors did she have, Howard? Pardon? Do you have any risk factors? Um, I don't really know. There are some calcifications there. I don't know if that's from remote tuberculosis or some other non-tuberculous granuloma infection. Okay. But she's not on treatment, I know, but at least she wasn't, I think. But she's got a long-term catheterine, so I'm not really sure. Okay. But... And then she's got a persistent left SVC, which is just an incidental finding. So it's kind of a gotcha, but I always tell the people I work with, the residents, that if you see a focal cavitary opacity, or even if it's not cavitary, but necrotizing, and you see adjacent airways are abnormal, think infection, 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 then it's just a matter of what infection it is, and also think of non-bacterial infection, mycobacterial fungus, and so on. So that got them all riled up when it turned out to be tuberculosis. <clears throat> this one, I wish I had a, a lateral projection of the chest to show you. So it's going to look like this if I had one. So the interesting finding is I, I'm not sure if one would see this, but if you look at the, which would project in the left infrahyla region and on a lateral projection of the chest, if this opacity was discernible on it, then in this patient, let me just separate these two and get the image. This is due to a common osteum of the inferior pulmonary veins, but it's unusually large. So here it is on the thin cuts. And you can see the superior pulmonary veins drain to it and the inferior pulmonary veins drain to it. 
and there's your common ostium, but it's quite large. And I think it might produce an opacity, which may be subtle on the lateral projection of the chest, which would be right there. So just a curiosity of anatomy and anatomic variation, but kind of almost like a varix, at least in terms of its size, it's relatively large. Hmm. So that's a curiosity. This one is interesting. I think it's the first case that I've seen or that I've noticed. <clears throat> so it's got to do with a pacemaker. Let me show you what the post placement would look like. So it looks like this left pectoral pacemaker, and you report this and you say one intact lead terminates in the right atrial appendage and the other terminates, and then you look at it and say, where's this other one? So we go to the lateral. This gives you a feel. This is the usual atrial appendage lead. Here is the other one, and that doesn't look right. So this one turns out to be a pacemaker lead placed intentionally in that location for so-called his bundle, his bundle pacemaker. So here is an intraprocedural image, and you can see it there and there. Here is an intraprocedural image at a time when temporarily they had a lead in the right ventricle that they subsequently put into the right atrial appendage. But this lead over there is the his bundle pacemaker lead. And here is some relevant anatomy. So this is kind of where they go and they go on this atrial side of the tricuspid valve annulus. And they do some mapping there until they can see a potential that's called the his bundle potential. And then they go to the place where they find that his bundle potential. And eventually, if they're satisfied, they will leave and screw the pacemaker lead into that location. So here is kind of a description that you can just look over, but you can see after we identified the his bundle, we positioned and repositioned the lead until we had a stable position with capture and they screwed it in. So it turns out that um, if you look in with Google, you'll see there are lots of case reports and descriptions of his bundle pacing. It's becoming something that's becoming more popular and there are advantages and disadvantages to it. But sometimes, for example, um, they improve pacing um, I didn't know this, but conventional right ventricular pacing can produce a pacemaker-induced cardiomyopathy, and his bundle pacing is better. They use it for different kinds of bundle blocks, and sometimes they're even beginning to use it in place of CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, for people that need that to improve um, synchrony of left ventricular contraction. So there's a lot of physiology there I don't understand, but suffice it to say, this is becoming something that people are starting to do a lot more, and it's his bundle pacing, in which case this is the proper placement for it. Have you guys seen any examples of that in your places? Not yet, but now I'm going to start looking for it. Yeah. I guess the implication, Howard, is that the his bundle will supply both the RV and the LV. Is that it? Yeah, and depends where the block is and so on and so forth, and there are evolving indications exactly for that. It's a more physiologic form of pacing, and people are starting to use it in different uh, physiologic or pathophysiologic contexts, so-called his bundle pacing. Yep, exactly. Yep. This is a nice case of <clears throat> trying to understand on chest radiography what you're seeing. So if we start off looking at a combination of the PA and lateral that looks like this, we can see there's a pleural space issue. We have some pleural fluid, pleural air. There's residual pleural or extra pleural air up there. We have a chest tube. But then there's some other findings that need explaining. For example, bringing up this frontal projection of the chest, we can see the pleural line. That's fine. But then we see this opacity, which is really quite odd, and then some residual pleural fluid there. So let me bring up the coronal sequence. And let me just first show you that there is pleural and or extra pleural air in the apical chest. 
And the history we got is that this patient had bully or some kind of cystic lung disease. And they operated on that patient and they had problems with an air leak. So you can see the strange cystic spaces up there. Um, I think the patient may have presented initially with a spontaneous pneumothorax. But that procedure initially was complicated by a persistent air leak. So now in terms of that other finding, which is this one right there, if I now go to the mediastinal window, you will see that that is fat. So what they did here was they created a so-called pleural tent. So basically you take off the parietal pleura from the endothoracic fascia, and here clearly some extra pleural fat was dragged along with it, and then you use that parietal pleura on top of the lung to try and deal with an air leak, so that you end up with sometimes an extra pleural space actually, rather than an intrapleural space that contains some air. So certainly this fat here and the rest of the anatomy goes along with a pleural tent. I think there are different ways that surgeons do that procedure, but I think the common thing is the stripping of parietal pleura and then the suturing of it to the top of the lung when you, when you operate on a patient. And have you seen something quite like that or very similar to that so-called pleural tent? procedure? So our thoracic surgeon uses them all the time. Um, he uses them in lung volume reduction surgery where the lung is very compliant to sort of fill the space because otherwise they all invariably get air leaks. He also uses them if he's doing usually an upper lobectomy and a patient with bad emphysema to again yes. fill that space. And it's interesting because yes. we always struggle with you know, are we seeing a small pneumothorax? I and mean, your case has a lot more tissue in it. Usually it's yes. just one layer. Yes. Or are we seeing extra pleural gas? So one thing I found yes. very helpful is sort of the the so-called insertion point, like right there on your image, seems to the, the lung seems to stick, and so the gas tends to trap in the just the very apical portion. And even if they move around a little bit, it doesn't it doesn't move as freely because it's not actually intrapleural. But sometimes it's yeah. a real, real challenge. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure exactly what structure I'm seeing there. The fat I could understand, but I'm not entirely sure what that is. And perhaps this is extra plural, and maybe the catheter kind of ends up in, I don't know, both spaces? Yeah, to say, but here. yeah that's a thickened band of parietal pleura. Or something, yeah. And maybe it's a pleural tent that is disrupted. Maybe it's kind of failed and not entirely intact, perhaps. Hard to say, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's at least an example of a pleural tent procedure, perhaps in part a, a failed pleural tent procedure because there's still an issue with that apical pleural space. Okay, these two are kind of interesting. <clears throat> Both of these turned out to be incidental findings. So let me just show you this one first. This is an adenocarcinoma, but it's a very nice example of an adenocarcinoma in which there is pseudo-cavitation, distorted air spaces within. It's a lesion in which there's both solid and non-solid components, so ground glass as well as more attenuating opacity but very strange area, air spaces within, very typical for an adenocarcinoma. So when I saw that, I described it as that and very typical of that. And it turns out to be that, it turns out that there was some papillary pattern type of growth, at least on a CT guided lung biopsy, but that's an adenocarcinoma. Uh, let me show you this other one, which is kind of interesting too. So for this one, I want to show you actually the I want to make a minute image out of this one because the airspace associated with this one, minute, is um, actually easier to see. So let me try and bring that up into view. So here is the lesion. I'll just make it bigger, change the window width a little bit. So this is a thin minute. And if you look at this lesion up here, it really is a very nice example of just irregular airspaces. 
So also a lesion that is mostly air, mostly air spaces. And let me just try and bring this out to see if we can see whether on these MINIP images, there's a little bit of ground glass or tissue in the periphery of these air spaces. But that's another really nice example of the so-called pseudo cavitation of an adenocarcinoma. What's really interesting about this one is that I think when I go back in time to 2012, which I'll bring up alongside, and I'm going to make this one also a MINIP image, that I think I can find it there before. Somewhere up in there. Let's see if I can find it. So this is about, so that's about there. Well, I can't, yeah, I wonder about it being up here somewhere. But I thought I could perhaps see it before and that it is slowly increased over time between 2012 and 2017. But here it is, and this turns out to be an adenocarcinoma and an incidental finding. Here is just a description in which they say that, let's see, lipidic growth, yep. There's the uh, path, you can see there, it's invasive, but not lymphovascular invasive. Lipidic pattern, relatively small lesion. Sometimes I wonder whether these adenocarcinomas may over a person's lifetime never cause any harm. There's always the potential for so-called overdiagnosis. And perhaps this lesion is one that would never harm the patient if it was never discovered. But otherwise, a nice example of Howard, it's interesting you bring that point up because if you look at the current version of lung rads that's used for screening, a lot of these nodules that are sort of these very sub, you know, mostly ground glass, um, get followed for a long time. They may not ever be acted on because of if they don't go very quickly. But one thing that's not addressed, and I have a companion case I'll show, is the cystic spaces, which we know we see in these the so-called pseudo cavitation. They're just not addressed. Um, but they have a high correlation with adenocarcinoma, but I'm not sure we yep. know how aggressive those are. And you right. remember that case around several, probably more than several months ago, where I asked everybody how they would score it, and people were kind of all over the place because yeah. yours has sort of a solid rim and a very bubbly center, and that's... Yeah, it's kind of got that solid rim yeah. to it, isn't it? But I'll, when I show my cases, I'll show you my companion case to go along with yours. Is in, another cancer that you have to wonder how aggressive is it yeah exactly yeah you know even the tissue here is of relatively low attenuation so certainly consistent with lipidic growth as described on that pathology specimen for example there and in the periphery of the lesion here a little bit yeah yeah that's interesting all righty, Jeff, those are mine for this week. Okay, let's see. David, would you like to go? I can show you uh, thymolipomas. Thymolipomas, because... So let me bring up the scout view first. I have uh, two cases to show you, and this one has a stromatic scout view. Can we see a scout view? We do. Yep. Okay, so a very bulky lesion here in the left hemithorax. Um, not very descript here, you know, really nondescript. And <clears throat> unlike some of the classic thymoma, well, thymolipoma cases, this one doesn't seem to be hanging downward from the mediastinum at the level of the thymus gland. Nevertheless, here we have this very fatty tumor with some other soft tissue elements within it. And this is all scanned radiography here, and it's a little bit out of sequence, but this does arise from the anterior upper mediastinum, and the vessels that feed this thing extend downward from there. So that despite the fact that this thing ends up mostly at the lung base, it is actually hanging from the thymus, as is classic for this, the thymolipoma. So a very fatty lesion uh, with some other elements in it. And this was resected, and... Um, 
here's the um let me see i should, should pull up this gross here so here's the um, here's the gross specimen you can see this is quite large here's five centimeters and this lesion is very very large so a grande on the starbucks scale maybe a, a venti and this was a biopsy proved or resection proved thymolipoma so there were there was a lot of mature fat in it and then there were also thymic elements in it so they described these soft tissue components that we see here as uh, thymic tissue so we have the thymic tissue and the lipoma tissue here, so thymolipoma. Hmm. <clears throat> so let me show you the other other case here. Um, sorry, I've got this out of sequence here. So here's a, another case that's really a subtler thing, but there is this filling in here of the anterior cardiophrenic angle on the right. And on CT at this point, around the same time, you see fat and vessels in thymus, and then these vessels seem to drape down here in this fatty continuation that goes down and sits on the hemidiaphragm there. So let me show you this in coronal. So we do have this fatty lesion that extends from thymus and carries some vessels down with it and then ends up in the lower hemithorax. So these vessels, we could follow back to that thymic uh, origin site. So it's sitting on the diaphragm. This one was not resected, and it's been stable on serial chest radiographs and some CT scans for more than 10 years. So there's, they're not moving to do this, to remove this lesion. It's not as big, and it's not taking up as much space in the thorax as the other case, which required some resection. So two cases, the first is definitely thymolipoma. It's proved this one has very similar findings, vessels extending down from the tissue of the thymus and then draped down here. So two, one definite and one probable thymolipoma. And I had another case of with plain radiography that looked like a lot like this case, but I don't have any further imaging or path diagnosis, but I may be a thymolipoma as well. <clears throat> so, David, pathologically, are these lipomas with thymic rests in them, or are they, do they actually, ha well, here, I just looked it up. So, it's mature adipose tissue mixed with unremarkable thymic tissue, maybe a thymoplasm right. of thymic fat based on an annual, Annals of Diagnostic Pathology from 2009. Okay. But interestingly, according to this, 10% associated with thymoma-like perineoplastic syndromes. And that may be a selection bias because they had thymectomies for whatever. Yeah. Or they were symptomatic enough that they got they got imaging. Right. Hmm. Yeah. It says the fibrous capsule surrounds in lobules of mature adipose tissue intimately associated with unremarkable thymic tissue containing cortex medulla and Hassel's corpuscules may have thymic epithelial proliferation, myoid cells, and zones of dense fibrosis. So it's, 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 it's a strange it's, thing. Yeah, it sounds like it's just fat with a bunch of thymus in it. Well, I think that, I think there's some, there may be something about thymic tissue that stimulates fat because you know, as the thymus gland involutes, it usually ends up being fat. Right. So something of something about those cells that stimulates, you know, fat production. I know it's a strange thing. Very odd. Yeah. So it does exist. Uh, we have pathologic proof on the one case and yeah. strong presumption on this case. Interesting. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's see. I'll show my screen in a second here. All right, so here's a case that I think David will like. Let's see. We should do some, let's see, an old radiograph. Do you see a frontal radiograph? Yeah. So this, right. this is from 1997. And I think you can see that there's some nodules predominantly in the lung bases. Now here's 2003. 
and you can see these nodules are larger, and some of them may be developing some dense centers. So slowly growing nodules with probable calcification. And then this is the CT scan from 2017. I'm not sure why we just kept watching these, but um, when I see something like this, there's not too many things I can come up with. They so predominant, right? Yeah. So this oh, is all love amyloid. Multiple pulmonary amyloid domas. And the lymphadenopathy I've seen with amyloid as well. I'm not sure why they get that other than maybe there's a uh, white blood cell proliferation, plasma cells and T cells and whatnot. Um, but just slowly increasing over time. Um, this patient, as far as I could tell, did not have a plasma cell dyscrasia. So presumably uh, cells laying, laying down light uh, of amyloid. But interesting, Howard, along your points, um, there are some lucent spaces in the lungs, which don't... Small ones. Yeah. Some of them look like central lobular emphysema, but other ones wasn't convinced. But predominantly just mass-like proliferation. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, you're right. You've, uh, you've shown cases before of uh, mediastinal um, amyloidosis right. with big masses and calcification or probably ossification. Right. So I think what may be in the lymph nodes is actually amyloid material. It may be accumulating in lymph nodes and okay. causing the... And I think you even had some calcified lesions there in the lower mediastinum on the right. Yeah, a little bit right here. Kind of in that deep subcarinal space and along maybe the inferior pulmonary ligament. Yeah, it's interesting. Yet nothing really anywhere. The spleen isn't big, anything else. But this is just but this was impressive just because I mean we're talking twenty years of progression from an app even back then. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's a, a line from a biopsy. Okay, uh, let's look at some esophageal badness. Um, so this is a case of a guy with chronic pancreatitis. So this is a non-contrast chest CT that was done. And you'll see there's, um, as we go down, the esophagus is a little bit thickened. And then there's this abnormal gas collection sort of in the lower mediastinum. Let me make this a little larger. And then on the lung windows, we see there's it's almost like a little bit of consolidated lungs, some ground glass, some stuff centered around these basal airways. You see the inner bronchograms running through them. Very closely associated with this. Um, this is the abdomen that was done. It showed with some contrast. And we see at that time, this thickening of that esophageal lumen. There's, there's the oral contrast material and all the soft tissue thickening in that area. So the suspicion was raised that there's clearly some communication down here. And you can see this fluid tracking up along the esophageal wall. And in the upper abdomen, you'll see this pocket of liquid back here behind the stomach and then all this calcified pancreas and all this just unhappy looking you know, pseudocyst type stuff. So they, the concern was that the pseudocyst had sneaked up into the lower mediastinum and maybe had made the esophagus unhappy. The patient had had an endoscopy not that long ago, maybe within a week before the CT when it was clean, so they were a little skeptical. But we had to explain what was going on. So this is the cine from the esophagram, and it's very subtle. So you see a nice swallow. And right here, you see a little, let's try and blow it up a little bit here, this little jet of contrast. Right here, this little wisp of contrast right there. And then you see it moving in what mm. looks like tubular structures. And that was the first run. And then there's another run here. It's obliqued where you can still see it's persisting. It didn't clear. And you don't really see much on that run. And then they did one more here. And right, right there. See this little bit of contrast going right into that area. And then here's the... I think you see it well in the spot image. Oh, oh now we see the yeah. airways, don't we? In the airways. So this is an esophagobronchial fistula, uh, presumably from digestion from the pancreatic pseudocyst, uh, because there was it, it was a new finding here, uh, resulting from this chronic pancreatitis. So this was 
very subtle, but a, a, just a really pretty case. And you just have to explain this area here in the in the right lower lobe. It's just this area of consolidation with this little ga extra luminal gas right in here. So the, presumably that's where the fistula is. And it's easier to see that you can see the pseudocyst right here. It's just easier to see on the abdominal CT when there's a little bit of contrast on board. It brings it out a little bit because you see the mucosa, but this area right in here. So, and I presume there's some amylase and lipase, lipase hanging out over here and other pancreatic juices. So we've seen some large intrathoracic pseudocysts, but I don't think I've seen one erode into the esophagus before. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Not seen. Oh, yeah, it's 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 That's remarkable. So here's a, a another esophageal case. Now I I don't have tissue in this, and I probably never will because I don't think much is gonna good is gonna come from this. But this patient was uh, potentially gonna be referred to us for management of this abnormal esophagus. And you'll see on the CT scan here that the wall is thick. There's liquid in the lumen. There's these big round mediastinal nodes. But what was striking, and there was the, the, the referral was for potential left atrial mass. And you'll see there's this protruding in the left atrial posterior wall. And you see this, the esophagus no longer looks like a normal lumen. It's expanded outward here. There's gas layering in here. And then there's looks like maybe extra luminal gas and then as we're looking, I'll zoom out a little bit and change the window for you. You see there's gas and, and liquid filling the pericardium Ooh. here. And then not to mention he's in heart failure with an EF of about 35%. So, and I'll show the sagittal because I thought it showed it best. You can see this nice filling defect in the left atrium. So I think this is probably an esophageal cancer that has eroded into the pericardium and caused an esophageal pericardial fistula, but has continued to grow and now has invaded the myocardium of the posterior wall of the left atrium. And it's sort of acting like a contained rupture. You see the pericardial enhancement, the gas tracking here, and then this very unhappy looking esophagus and left atrium. So I know Travis has shown a couple complications from procedures with esophageal atrial fistulas, but this is the first time I think I've seen a cancer grow grow through the pericardium into the heart. Because I think the pericardium is fairly tough, although there may be some absent portions of it posteriorly here. But wow. I don't think uh, the, the, I don't think I think that this is uh, I don't think anybody can do much about this. I mean, maybe put a stent across it, but it's obviously a very tenuous situation. Okay. Um, Changing gears a little bit. This is a this is a companion case to yours, Howard. So this is I'll show the CT first because I think that's the only fair way to show it. So this I actually got the path back today. It was biopsied. This is a smoker who had a CT for whatever reason, and this lesion was identified. Very bubbly. It does have a little bit of a solid rind here and there, and a little bit of a solid component. But this is a proven adenocarcinoma. I only have a needle biopsy, so I don't have a subtype of it. Um, there was a recent, I think there was a recent article on these cystic ones in maybe the Yellow Journal a, a year or so ago, but we do recognize these as being adenocarcinomas. But interestingly, you know, if this were in a screening patient, how would you score this? Is it part solid? Is it ground glass? I think it's mostly cystic in this case. Um, I would give it an X because I know it's a lung cancer, but the question is, is how aggressive is it? Well, I, I think I have some idea. Because I went back through the PAX record and only knowing that it's there, here's the radiograph from 2014, where you can, so, and knowing it's there, see this area here. So it's been there for at least three years. I would never call it. I don't think anybody would. Really hard to see. Um, I don't think you can really make it out on the lateral very well. And this is even 2016. It's even still tough to see. You've got one edge of it here. So maybe this interface would catch your eye, but... Turning this into a cystic lesion would be rather tough. And then here's yeah. 2017. It's still there. But, you know, again, I don't know if you're going to, whoops, if you're going to ever call something like that. This is the, uh, in the coronal here. I'll show you on the coronal too to, to show you kind of what it looks like. But, you know, you're, we're probably catching this solid band on the radiograph, but really mm. not seeing a lot of the other margin, maybe that inferior margin. 
So I was actually impressed with whoever did the biopsy. They got a, a biopsy because there's not a lot of solid tissue, but they went after this portion right here. And it had Interesting. To, so yeah. yeah. And, and you, you said yours was a papillary type. I don't know what I don't know what type this was. Yeah, the one I showed that was similar to this one, right. not a cystic. And that one turned out to be some papillary growth. But I think that was also on a needle biopsy, so you have a relatively limited sampling. Right. Right, and sometimes they just can tell it's an adenocarcinoma. So this is another sneaky lung cancer with a fun, doesn't follow the law of Caney, but so this patient has had this tubular structure on, for some time um, and has this lucent right upper lobe. And in the long time ago, pre, I mean, many years ago, this had been called a vascular malformation, but no one had ever proven it. And when you look at the CT, I, it's, it's tubular, it's branching, it's associated with lucency. I think we might think about bronchial atresia instead. And I will show you that here. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful case of right upper lobe bronchial atresia involving the apical segment. So here's the anterior and posterior segments, but there's no apical segmental bronchus. And it's quite large. And these are huge mucoceles or bronchoceles. Uh, there's maybe a few cystic spaces. I wasn't happy calling this a hybrid lesion. I think it's just a bronchial atresia in probably its purest form. But going back to the radiograph, there's another little guy here, right here under the first rib. And I, I meant to save the subtraction image. I didn't, but you can see it better. And so this is a great example of um, satisfaction of search or whatever you want to call it. Also happened to have this ugly great. thing here. So this was a lung cancer. And I came across this case because I read one of the follow-up post-surgery. This was resected and, the, um, and cured with, with surgery and all that business, and there's been no new cancer. But interestingly, um, they were in the same patient, but the wherever this radiograph was interpreted at the time, back in 2014, I think it was somewhere else, they were not, uh, this was not recognized. It was, the CT was done shortly thereafter, so it didn't change the stage, but this thing was a big distractor to the original observer. So it's, it's a tough case. I'll show you the lateral. You can see there's the lung cancer up here. Wait. Here's your yeah, no, you, yeah. So it's just in a yeah. tough spot. And then you, on top of that, you have another abnormality. So I don't know what we call it when you have a congenital and a neoplastic lesion, but it's not, not the law of Caney. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Two more. This is cool. I think you guys will like this because this is the best example I've ever seen on a chest radiograph of interstitial emphysema. So this was a trauma. You can see this patient developed ARDS, is on ECMO at this time, young, young individual, um, and had this dense lung disease consolidation everywhere. But these beautiful, what look like septal lines, except they're the wrong color. You got air bronchograms. Notice the drain. This drain uh, kind of has a little funny turn in it. But I've got a CT to correlate with it, which um, fortunately I don't have the thin images because um, it was done elsewhere. Which I hope I got the right CT. Yeah, this was the outside trauma CT. But you can see at the time had this beautiful interstitial emphysema, both lungs. You see it along, even along this fissure here, pneumothoraces, pneumomediastinum. But look along the the inferior pulmonary vein here, the inferior pulmonary ligament, the intersublobar septum, just beautiful gas tracking in there. And then I'll bring it up on the coronal as well. Just make it bigger. Okay, there you oh, go. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're, they're the black curly lines, if you want to call them those. But I've never seen it on a, well, I should rephrase, I've never recognized it on a radiograph. You can see it coming up there. So. I just thought this was a gorgeous case. Very nice. Yeah. Wow. Barrow the ones on the left are. Yeah, they're small. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and the late uh, Judd Gurney called those black lightning bolts of oh, interstitial. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think you should. Call it, I think you should call it yipe ipe. <laughs> so this is. Um, this is a nice something I've never seen happen. So we've seen cases of migrated. Pacer leads. So this patient has a defibrillator pacer combo, and and the original radiograph has this left ventricular lead going through the coronary sinus and out a vein to do the synchronization that Howard was alluding to earlier. And one of my colleagues noticed on the follow up, um, and I can't remember what the exact indication was, but it was somewhat related to the pacemaker. 
that that lead was now sitting here, and I'll blow it up, in the right ventricle. And you see it better on the lateral. So here's the new lateral. And there it is right here. So if you look sitting anteriorly near the RV lead, if you go to the old lateral, it's in its expected location posterior. Yeah. yeah. A little smaller for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've seen I've seen RV leads pull back. I've seen atrial leads flip out. But I have to say, I don't think we'd ever seen a – let me bring it back up here. I've never seen an L, uh, a left ventricular coron or coronary sinus lead migrate that much. And we couldn't figure out how it happened because if you look at the – so this is the – let me put the two PAs up against each other make them a little small. You'll notice there's no change in the configuration of the generator. So it wasn't a twiddler. It wasn't a capacious pocket where it rolled up a bit. I mean, it's about the same number of wraps. There's really, other than the arm position, there's no change. So it must have just, through pulsation or poor anchoring, just sort of worked its way back. But that's a long way to go. But it would be following blood flow. So I guess it could have happened if it did not anchor properly. Have either and it's ended up in the right atrium somewhere? Right ventricle, yeah. So it followed the blood flow, but I, it's just a long way. To, it seems like it's a long way wow. to go for a lead to go on its own. I don't know. Have either of you ever seen one migrate that far? Not that far, I don't think. I've seen some come back a bit. Okay. That I remember that far. But, and that explained why the, they had lost synchronization. So that... Uh, Bring up the lateral for the most recent one, and let's see where we see that again. You see it here anteriorly towards the apex, and here's the old lateral, and you see that it was back here going out the coronary sinus. So it's just following the RV lead and hanging out there. So it came all the way back, and then it just flipped yeah. into the RV. So it followed the path of blood, followed the cardiac vein to the, to the great cardiac vein to the coronary sinus, and then, All right. then it, through the, yeah, to the yeah. so then it came into the atrium and followed blood into the right ventricle, and I guess it's so small it was able to work its way across the tricuspid valve fairly easily. Yeah. So interesting. Wow, yeah, that was a fun case. But yeah, they. My understanding is they use this synchronization therapy in people with more advanced cardiac. Like I think it's like New York Heart Association class three or higher. There's a survival benefit, at least last time I read something about it. To, to, by, by synchronizing the ventricles, you optimize the cardiac output and reduce any extra work to try to improve it. <clears throat> There's a big hiatal hernia back there, Jeff. Is that why we have that gas collection? Yeah. I, that's what this actually, and that's a second. You can see the interface on the frontal view with the fluid level. A double density sign. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So that's all the cases I have. Let me, let, me, let me see. I might have one more. Let's just pause for a second and see what I got here. Um, well, this is just a pretty example. I'll go ahead and show it. And um, two pretty cases. Nothing, nothing super exciting, but ones I think you'll like. Um, where did we go? All right. So you should... See a CT now. So this is a lung transplant recipient. And I just saved this case because I thought it was just a great example, if you ever wanted to show somebody, of a mosaic pattern of attenuation. I mean, this is, I would argue this would be a textbook quality or whatever we do now, online lecture. But gorgeous example of, of mosaic attenuation. And I've got the expiratory images to prove that is indeed air trapping. And then... What else was cool about it was I like this image is because this was for IPF and you can see the entire native lung is just cysts. I mean, there's maybe a, the world's smallest rind of viable parenchyma there. But if you, I mean, I don't think I've seen that diffuse cystic, whatever we call it, honeycombing or whatnot. But it was just made a pretty picture when I was reading the radiograph, so I saved it. But it's a nice example of that true mosaic attenuation where it's very lobular. It's not just regional air trapping and all related to chronic rejection in this case. And then just another nice pattern case. This was a young woman with fever and cough and her initial radiograph showed, uh, here's the frontal, showed this patchy area of consolidation in the right lower lobe 
on subsequent. That he had to do that. Whole case. Oh, you're not. That's so weird. How does it do that? All right. Well, um, there we go. go. You see it now? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then uh, it persisted. So that's this is the original radiograph, and it changed a little bit. It got a little denser in the periphery and a little more loose in the center portion. I'll put them up side by side, but not a whole lot of change. But the CT is just spectacular. And if you ever need a nice example of reverse halo signs or atoll signs. Oui. So an organizing pneumonia pattern, presum presumably the patient was worked up, never found an infection, responded to steroids clinically. So a presumed cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which I still am convinced is pretty much always post-infectious. Okay. Well, that is it. That's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. And uh, Travis should be back next week. I'll I should be around. So we will resume. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good Thank rest you. of the week. You too. All right, bye. See you, bye. David. Bye. bye.